Hello and welcome back Discovery Learners to another episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. It is I, Teacher Liz here, your host once more on today, Thursday. On this episode, we're going to go over some observances, interesting history, I'll be showing you some cool landmarks, animals, pretty plants, and of course some interesting facts. So let's not delay any further, let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Hey Discovery Learners, Substitute Teacher Andrew's back with some new observances for this day. Our first observance is National Cellophane Tape Day. It could be a sticky situation on May 27th as we recognize National Cellophane Tape Day. Can you imagine where we would be without this invention? Wrapping presents would be slightly more difficult without it. It's also known as a visible tape or scotch tape. This invention can be found in every household and office. Richard Gurley Drew invented the invisible tape in 1930. He created the tape from cellulose and originally called it cellulose tape. His career started at 3M back in 1920 in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he developed a masking tape for automotive industry in 1925. Originally designed to seal cellophane packages sold in grocery stores and bakeries, the adhesive missed its mark, but it had a resounding endorsement from customers. 3M found a market in both the home and the office. Many of us keep several rolls of it too. Check the closet next to your wrapping paper. There'll be another junk drawer and you can find some there. It just has so many uses. And I bet you're wondering how you can celebrate this day. Well, that's easy. Maybe take the time to hang up a picture or fix a piece of paper that might be torn or that dollar bill that's been floating around your wallet. Let us know in the comment section below how you plan on observing No Cellophane Tape Day. Our last observance is National Great Popsicle Day. And what a perfect thing to celebrate since it's getting a little warmer. In San Francisco, California in 1905, an 11-year-old Frank Epperson was outside on his porch, mixing water with white flavored powdering to make a soda. Upon going inside, he left there on the porch, with the stirring stick still in it. That night, temperatures reached a record low, and the following morning, Frank discovered the drink had frozen to the stick. Years later, in 1922, Frank introduced his treat at the Fireman's Ball, where it was a huge success. Then in 1923, he made and sold his frozen treat on the stick at an amusement park in Alameda, California. Frank Epperson applied for a patent in 1924 for his frozen confectionery, which he called Epsicle Ice Pops. He then renamed it Popsicles. Popsicles are one of the summertime favorite treats for kids of all ages. National Great Popsicle Day honors one of our most favorite flavors. How about you, Discovery Learners? Great Popsicles just so happen to be my favorite popsicles. But what about you? Let us know in the comment section below. Go ahead and comment down below and let us know how you plan on observing, well, these observances for today. On this day in history. Today in 1703, St. Petersburg, Leningrad was founded by Russian Tsar Peter the Great. Founded by the Tsar Peter the Great on May 27, 1703, it became the capital of the Russian Empire for more than 200 years. From 1712 to 1918, St. Petersburg ceased being the capital in 1918 after the Russian Revolution of 1917. Today, in 1933, the Walt Disney short film Three Little Pigs is released and also wins an Academy Award for Best Animated Film in 1934. The Three Little Pigs is an animated short film released on May 27, 1933 by United Artists, which was produced by Walt Disney and directed by Burt Gillett. It's based on the fable of the same name. The Silly Symphony won a 1934 Academy Award for Best Animated Short Film of 1933. The short cost about $22,000 and grossed about $250,000 in the box office. In 1994, it was voted number 11 of the 50 greatest cartoons of all time by the members of the animation field. In 2007, Three Little Pigs was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry. 
and the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, aesthetically significant. The Three Little Pigs premiered at Radio City Music Hall as a short subject to Radio City's release of the first national pictures, film Elmer the Great. Today, in 1995, actor Christopher Reeve is paralyzed from the neck down after falling from his horse in a riding competition in Culpeper, Virginia. Christopher Reeve was an American actor, director, and activist best known for playing the main character and title role in the film Superman. Born in New York and raised in Princeton, New Jersey, Christopher Reeve discovered a passion for acting in the theater at the age of nine. He studied at Cornell and Juilliard School and made his way to Broadway and debuted in 1976. After his acclaimed performance in Superman and Superman 2, Reeve declined many roles in action movies, choosing instead to work on small films and plays with more complex characters. On May 27, 1995, Reeve broke his neck when he was thrown from a horse during an equestrian competition in Culpeper, Virginia. The injury paralyzed him from the shoulders down, and he used a wheelchair and ventilator for the rest of his life. From his wheelchair, Reeve returned to creative work, directing In the Gloomy in 1997, and acting in the television remake of Rear Window in 1998. He also made several appearances in Superman-themed television series, Smallville, and wrote two autobiographical books, Still Me and Nothing is Impossible. Over the course of his career, Christopher Reeve received a BAFTA Award, a Screen Actors Guild Award, an Emmy, and a Grammy Award. Go ahead and leave a comment below and let us know what you think of today's historical events. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure born today is Christopher Lee, born May 27, 1922, in London, England. This renowned English actor became known for playing Count Dooku in Star Wars and Saruman in The Lord of the Rings. Early in his career, he portrayed Count Dracula in the Hammer horror films. Before he was famous, he made his acting debut in a school production of Rumpelstiltskin. He unfortunately passed away June 7, 2015 at the age of 93. But an interesting piece of trivia to know about him is, he's the actual cousin of the author of the James Bond spy novels, Ian Fleming. Wow! Happy birthday Christopher Lee! Our next notable figure born today is Paul Bettany, born May 27, 1971, also in London, England. This English actor who played the role of Silas in Da Vinci Code. He also played roles in A Beautiful Mind, Iron Man, The Avengers, and Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World. Before he was famous, he appeared in a BBC version of Dickens' classic, Oliver Twist, at the age of 21. More recently, he reprised his role as Vision in the series WandaVision, available on Disney+. Plus. He turns 50 years old today! Wow! Happy birthday, Paul Bettany! Another notable figure born today is Lisa Lopez. Born May 27, 1971, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This American rapper, dancer, and singer, known as Left Eye, who was a member of the hip hop female group TLC, and who became known for the singles Ain't Too Proud to Beg and What About Your Friends. She also won four Grammy Awards. Before she was famous, she moved around from place to place while growing up before she found her home in Atlanta and joined the group Second Nature. She unfortunately passed away April 25th, 2002 at the age of 30. But an interesting piece of trivia to know about her is she co-wrote the song Girl Talk with her friend and band member Tioni Watkins, also known as T-Boz. 
Wow, that's pretty interesting. Happy birthday, Lisa Lopez. And our last notable figure born today is Andre 3000. Born May 27, 1975 in Atlanta, Georgia. This American rapper, producer, singer, and actor who is the half of the hip-hop duo OutKast, who had the mega hit with the song Hey Ya in 2003. He has also appeared in films such as Semi-Pro and Four Brothers. Before he was famous, he met Antoine Big Boy Patton, his future OutKast partner, while still in high school. He turns 46 years old today. Happy birthday, Andre 3000. Happy birthday, everyone. Come along, Discovery Learners, and we will see the landmarks of the world. As we continue our journey of discovery throughout El Salvador, here are some landmarks you should definitely see. Starting with Tazumal. Tazumal is the most impressive Mayan ruin in El Salvador. An archaeologist estimated it was first settled in around 5000 BC and then abandoned around 1200 AD. The architectural complex was excavated and extensively restored during the 1940s and 50s, but many of the ruins remain unexcavated. Tazumal is believed to have been an important center of trade, and its language in the Keichi language means pyramid where the victims were burned. Whoa! People are able to visit this vast site and learn about the history of the Mayan civilization through the on-site museum they have there. Wow, pretty cool. Our next stop is Playa El Tunco. Playa El Tunco is a funky two-street beach town that is popular with backpackers and surfers. There, you can relax on the pebbly black beaches, which are at their best for surfing early in the morning. You can take a stroll around the quaint town or visit breathtaking beach caves when the tide is low. Playa El Tunco is popular with Salvadorians as well as travelers, so the city is always packed on the weekends. Wow, this place looks fun. It looks like a place you go to to have a party. Next up is Suchitoto. Located about 50 kilometers northeast of the capital city, San Salvador, Suchitoto is a former colonial city and a current cultural hub of the country. Arts and food festivals occur all the time here, filling the streets with visitors from around the country and beyond. Enjoy a stroll in the cobblestone streets of the city to view the fantastic well-preserved Spanish colonial buildings, or hike around the area to find waterfalls and caves. The city is in the bird migration zone, so dust up your binoculars to spot some more than 200 species that frequent the area. Wow, that's pretty neat. The buildings are cool too. And you get the bird watch there. Pretty neat. Next up is Ruta de las Flores. The Ruta de las Flores is a trail that leads travelers to some of the beautiful villages of El Salvador. Named after the wildflowers that grow along the road, which is best viewed from November to February, the route travels from San Sonsonate to Ataco for around 40 kilometers. All along the trail, you see much culture and history of the area from Spanish colonial buildings as well as local food options, weekend markets, and stunning views. Our next landmark is Lake Ilopango. Lake Ilopango is a crater lake filling a volcanic caldera in central El Salvador. The caldera collapsed sometime between 410 and 535 AD, and the lake, which is the largest in the country, sits at an altitude of 1,450 feet. The lake itself, which fills an extinct volcano, is 72 square kilometers. Lake Ilopango is popular with travelers and locals because of its beautiful glassy waters and the views from the lake of the surrounding volcanic peaks. Many locals drive to fish in the water, which reaches a depth of 240 meters or more. Wow, I definitely would want to take a swim in a lake that used to be a volcano. That sounds pretty cool. The next stop on our list is Puerta del Diablo. 
Who I thought the Diablo has a dark past filled with death and horror. But the striking views keep tourists coming back for more. Known as Devil's Door, the rock formation made of two boulders form a window looking out on El Salvador's lush landscape. A winding pathway leads up the viewpoint where you see the indigenous town, Panchimalco, directly below, Lake Ilopango to the left, and the Twin Peaks San Vicente Volcano straight ahead with the Pacific behind it. There are more than 60 established rock climbing routes in the area as well as other adventurous activities like zip lining, canopy tours, and rappelling. Wow, and with a name like Devil's Door, that's definitely a place to go visit. It looks pretty cool too. And finally, our last stop is Santa Ana. Hey, we have a Santa Ana here in California too. But Santa Ana is also a city in El Salvador too. Santa Ana is located 65 kilometers from San Salvador. Santa Ana is a city full of tree-lined streets and vibrant buildings that made its wealth from the coffee industry. As the second largest city in the country, Santa Ana has a growing cultural scene and a grand atmosphere. Along with its own beauty, the city offers alternative base camp for travelers looking to explore Tazumal ruins or the Ruta de las Flores. Here you can also see the Neo-Gothic Cathedral, which was completed in 1913 and covered in intricate carvings on its exterior. Wow, pretty interesting. 1913, that's post-colonial age. Pretty cool looking buildings. Now El Salvador is a very old country with a rich history and it also has lots to see. But unfortunately we do not have time to show it all. But what we did get to see was pretty amazing. Now be sure to stay tuned for tomorrow's episode of Ability to Learn as we finish teaching you a little bit more about El Salvador. Here's the animal of the day. Today's animal is the armadillo. Armadillos are the only mammals whose body are covered with a hard shell. Only one armadillo species, the nine-banded armadillo, lives in North America. The other 19 types live in South America. They inhabit grasslands, rainforests, and semi-arid areas. Most armadillo species are threatened because of the habitat loss and hunting. It's very unfortunate because they're super cute and they vary in size from 5 to 59 inches in length and from 3 pounds all the way up to 120 pounds. It can be pink, dark brown, black, red, gray, or even yellowish in color. Their whole body, their head, back, legs, and tail are covered with bony plates. Only the three-banded armadillo can curl into a ball to protect itself from predators. Other armadillos run or dig holes when they need to escape from predators. Their legs and long claws are perfectly adapted for digging. They can dig and create networks of tunnels underground, and they sleep from 16 to 18 hours per day in their burrows. Armadillos also dig in the ground to find their favorite food, insects. But besides insects, they also like to eat small mammals, baby birds, eggs, roots, and even fruit. Just like anteaters, they have a long sticky tongue that works perfectly for when they hunt ants and termites. They also like fire ants. Armadillos have very poor eyesight and usually a well-developed sense of smell to help find their prey. Armadillos also happen to be great swimmers. They can hold their breath to up to six minutes. They're also excellent climbers and they can climb over a fence in case they can't get under it. Reproduction of armadillos is very unique. Although mating season takes place in July, the female can postpone pregnancy up until November. This is called delayed implantation. Females can postpone their pregnancy until environmental conditions become satisfying. From one egg, four identical armadillos will be born. They're called quadruplets. The baby armadillos are born without any bunny plates. It takes a few weeks for their soft skin to turn into hard armor, and an armadillos live from four to seven years in the wild, and up to 12 to 15 years in captivity. That's a big difference. Did I mention they're super cute? They always remind me of the Pokemon Sand Shrew. Let us know in the comment section below if you've ever seen an armadillo. So what do you think of today's animal? Is it cute? Is it creepy? Go ahead and let us know what you think in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is St. John's Wort. St. John's Wort is a herbaceous plant that is native to Europe that can be found all around the world today. 
St. John's wort inhabits pastures, meadows, woodlands, deforested areas, and inhabits disrupted by fire. It grows on well-drained, moist soil, in sunny areas, or in partial shade. St. John's wort spreads quickly and has easily occupied new habitats. It's classified as an invasive species in numerous countries. However, despite its invasive nature, St. John's wort is one of the most respected and most commonly used types of medical herbs. St. John's wort has a multi-branched reddish stem that can reach 1 to 3 feet in height. It also develops strong taproot and numerous lateral roots. Taproot usually grows 2 to 5 feet below the ground. St. John's wort has narrow, oblong, light green leaves that are oppositely arranged on the branches. St. John's wort produces yellow or orange flowers covered with black dots on the edges of the petal. The flowers are star-shaped, other than flat-topped clusters. St. John's wort blooms at the beginning of the summer and attracts numerous insects, mostly bees and bumblebees. They are responsible for the plant's pollination. The fruit of the St. John's wort is reddish-brown, capsuled and divided into three sections, filled with dark seeds. St. John's wort can be propagated by a seed, cuttings, or via division of the root. The St. John's wort leaves are covered with numerous oil glands that are nearly transparent when the leaves are oriented towards the sun. According to old European tradition, St. John's wort is harvested on the 24th of June. This date is celebrated as St. John's Day in Eastern Orthodox Church, hence the name St. John's Wort. St. John's Wort contains numerous compounds that are effective in the treatment of depression, anxiety, and mood swings during menopause, among many other disorders. But St. John's Wort needs to be consumed cautiously because it reduces the activity of birth control pills and drugs used in the treatment of AIDS, anxiety, insomnia, arrhythmia, and hypochlorosterolemia. St. John's Wort can be used to induce toxic effects in dogs, rabbits, horses, sheep, cows, swine, and many other animals. The compound is called hypersin. It induces sensitivity to light and leads to blistering and peeling of the skin of animals. The same effect can be seen in sensitive people as well. In other words, be very careful and keep it away from your pets. Ancient Romans were using St. John's wort during the battles to treat inflammation and accelerated healing of their wounds. The strong white root system of the St. John's wort can be used to control the erosion of soil. And the St. John's wort is a perennial plant, which means that it lives more than two years. That's super interesting, and I only knew I passed it on the supplement aisle at work. Let us know in the comment section below if you knew any of these really cool facts about the St. John's wort. It's that time again. We just learned about a new plant. So go ahead and tell us what you think in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is transparent. It's an adjective. It means of matter or oracle, allowing light to pass through so that objects behind can be distinctly seen, clear, easy to perceive or detect, transparent. Our next word is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's episode. That word is aesthetic. It is spelled A-E-S-T-H-E-T-I-C. As an adjective, it means concerned with beauty or appreciation of beauty, giving or designed to give pleasure to beauty or of a pleasing appearance. Aesthetic. Let's take a look at the art of the day. Today's artworks are the clay pottery from Ilo Bosco, El Salvador. Ilo Bosco in El Salvador is a city renowned for its clay pottery. Ilo Bosco is located in the central region of El Salvador, about 42 kilometers from San Salvador and about 75 kilometers from the international airport. Ilo Bosco's pottery and crafts are made out of clay and are known locally and internationally. This clay, which is extracted locally, is used for creating miniature items that display daily scenes lived by Salvadorians. In Ilo Bosco, you'll find different pottery and handicrafts, such as traditional crafts that include pots, pans, and flower pots. Also, 
religious crafts such as Catholic images, the Virgin Mary, and Christmas decorations. Lastly, there are typical ceramic items such as small human figurines that represent Salvadorian daily life. One of the most popular Ibasco craft items are, are miniatures that people call surprises. Surprises are a clay item covered with another piece of clay shaped and painted in the form of a fruit or typically an egg. The first part can be removed and then a surprise can be revealed. Some of these are pretty neat and all of these are very unique, making it a work of art. So what do you think of these clay sculptures from El Salvador, Discovery Learners? What are some of your favorites? Have you seen anything like these before? Maybe at a Mexican supermarket? Go ahead and share your thoughts in the comment section below. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that one cloud can weigh as much as 100 elephants? It's true! Clouds appear to float effortlessly in the sky, that one would think that they're weightless. However, this is actually far from fact. A single cumulus cloud weighs 1.1 million pounds on average. To put this in perspective, that is equal to the weight of about 100 elephants or 2,500 donkeys. That's crazy! Now I guess you're wondering, do all clouds weigh the same? Well, different clouds have different densities. Therefore, different clouds have different weights. For instance, you can visibly differentiate between a thin wispy cirrus versus the monstrous cumulimbus thunderclouds. Big, dark cumulimbus clouds carry about six times as much weight as the cumulus clouds on average. A thin wispy cirrus cloud is 10 times lighter than the cumulus cloud. That comes about 100,000 grams of water or the 20th of a gram of water in each cubic meter. So how do clouds stay floating in the air? Well, these clouds do contain rain. So there are millions of pounds of water floating over us at every given moment. The obvious question that follows, how do clouds manage to stay afloat with all that weight? The large weight is sustained because it is spread out into millions of droplets over large space. Each of these droplets are so small that many of them will need to come together to make a single drop. Each of the droplets actually weigh about 2 microns across, meaning it's thinner than a human hair, which is about 50 to 70 microns. So yeah, one cloud can weigh as much as 100 elements. Pretty interesting, huh? Yes, cue the credits. This means we have reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. So farewell, Discovery Learners. Teacher Liz here is saying thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to attend the live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day Program's educational team. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day Program.